And now, the survival show that once survived, a Weimariner's first Hanukkah bush. In this episode, we're joined by Jonathan Hollerman of Grid Down Consulting. We discuss the basics of selecting and putting together a bug out location that may just get you through the big scenarios. Howdy and welcome to the Rabbit Holes Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 237. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Jonathan, welcome to In the Rabbit Hole. Hi, Aaron. How are you? And I'm doing all right. And I'm excited for this episode one because I think it's a really important episode that we've never had anybody on that truly dedicates their time to this topic. And and also given your background, uh, it's pretty interesting. Let's get a little into your background real quick. So you're a former SEER instructor. How did you tell us a little, tell us about getting into the military and then becoming a SEER instructor? So SEER instructor is one of those career fields that's not a guaranteed job. So to become a SEER instructor, you actually have to go to basic training and apply to become a SEER instructor. And I think for my class, I think around 8,000 people applied and they do a whole bunch of physical tests and mental evaluations. There's there was like 4,000 questions psychological test apparently i passed but they ask you like <laughs> is this the do dogs barking make you sad you know and they ask you all these questions so i apparently i passed that and then we started with 200 individuals down in the stock program down in san antonio texas and from there they basically wrecked your butt off and starved you made you do lesson plans things of that nature and they sent 17 of us, I'm sorry, they sent 21 of us up to Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane, Washington to begin our SEER instructor training to become instructors. And I, I graduated in the class of 17. So wow, uh, it was a pretty, pretty hardcore training. The first class was in January. It was 28 days long in the mountains mm-hmm. of Washington State, they gave, for my group of eight guys, they gave us a box full of vegetables and a goat (laughs) for uh, 28 days. And uh, I was, man, I was the most fit I've ever been in my life at that point. And I lost 15 pounds on that trip. It was, I looked, I looked, I resembled a little bit of a Holocaust survivor coming out of that, that class. So Mm -hmm. that's where they weeded out a lot of the, the guys that, that, that didn't make it through was that first trip. They just kind of push your limits and 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 push you to see how far, see how much you can take. <laughs> wow. So um, for people not familiar with what SEER is, what is SEER and what do y'all do? Sure. So SEER stands for S-E-R-E, and it stands for Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. Our job as SEER instructors are to take Anybody that flies on a plane for their job, whether they be a pilot, a navigator, a a combat controller, flight controller, anything of that nature, and we take them out in the field. It's an 18-day course, and we kind of push them to their limits also. We take their food away, their sleep away, and we teach them how to survive if they get shot down behind enemy lines, how to evade the enemy. And then the second half of the course is a real-life POW camp that we run at the the base there and we teach them anti-interrogation techniques. So I can't really get into that side of it because that side of it's classified, but Mm. so that's, that's what SEER does. We teach anybody that flies on a plane for their job, how to survive, how to evade the enemy, how to resist interrogation techniques and how to escape from capture if they have that ability. Okay. And then from you there, you went on to, get into teaching others about preparedness from the things that you learned and the things that you taught and the things that you did. Does that translate well into teaching civilians about survival and preparedness? Yes and no. Um, So a lot of the survival sides of it, how to build a fire, how to purify water, how to build shelter, how to things of that nature, that stuff you can pick up from wilderness survival courses, right? So that's, Mm -hmm. there's nothing really proprietary on the survival side of it. The biggest takeaway that I, that I took from my SEER training 
that I apply to my preparedness consulting is dealing with hungry and desperate people. So mm. you've got this uh, cocky F-16 pilot that the military spend mi- spent millions of dollars training. You've got lieutenant colonels. My, my first class when I was just uh, an instructor trainer, it was a crew of flight medics, and they were all lieutenant colonels, and I'm an airman basic. I, I, maybe I was a one striper at the time, and I had to <laughs> I had to keep these guys alive out in the field. And so one of the biggest takeaways was you take a full grown man out into the woods. You know, these aren't like wimpy men that you're taking out in the field. And there wasn't a single class that I carried out there. Uh, Because the first thing we do is, you know, we, we take away their sleep. We, we minimize how much sleep they can get. We minimize how much food they eat. Uh, We put them in stressful situations. A lot of times, uh, you know, they've never been out in the mountains in the month month of January with six feet of snow on the ground, you, you put them in this extreme situation. There wasn't a single class that I had where I didn't have a full grown man breaking down crying that I'm having to push to, to get up and continue on with the training. So one of it was, you know, the big aspect I took away was desperate situations, dealing with hunger. And I think that's a big aspect that the preparedness community, they, they overlook because we're in America, and, and to be honest, nobody in America is really starved to death, they, unless it was intentional. Nobody here has really gone a long period of time without food, you know, unless it's by choice. You can always have access to food in this country. So I, I think a lot of preparedness people don't understand how bad psychologically it's going to get for the masses and how dangerous people are going to become when their four-year-old kid is starving to death on the couch and they will do anything to get that kid some food. So um, that was probably one of the biggest takeaways from my tier training. Outside of that, Aaron, uh, other than my the books that I've written and I've got four or five books now available, uh, one's a preparedness fan or I have a fictional series that I'm writing. Most of my time is as a preparedness consultant, and I specialize in survival retreat design. And so people call me and and I fly out and take a look at their survival retreat. I go through all their their aspects of their preparedness from their food to their their power generation to their, their bunkers, the whole nine yards, operational security for their perimeter. And I basically make recommendations on how they can improve their current situation on top of that, I, I also do a lot of from the ground up. So I've got a lot of clients that are building, starting out from the ground up, building survival retreats. So I do a lot of the architectural architectural aspects of designing a cabin that will function off grid, uh, helping them find the, the right piece of property. Because that's a big failure that a lot of people make. They they put a lot of money in bunkers and infrastructure on a piece of property that's too close to a city or right off a main road that could be seen from the road. So finding the right piece of property is key. What do you personally, I want to get into more of your clients and some of the things going on with that and some of the practical stuff. What are you personally worried about right now? What's your prepper jam? We'll say my prepper jam. Well, I believe the number one threat to this country right now is North Korea. The media completely get the, the threat from North Korea, absolutely wrong. They're just flat out wrong. They're 100% focused on North Korea's intercontinental ballistic missile program. And that is not the threat to this country. I mean, if, if North Korea hit us with a nuclear bomb, you know, in North Korea, that's assuming we didn't shoot it down on its flight here. We're going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And that's not the threat. They have super EMP weapons. They got the technology from Russia in 2004. Russia warned us in 2004 hmm. that their nuclear scientists that designed their super EMPs took the technology in North Korea. That was 13 years ago. They've had this technology. And they have super EMP weapons designed today. They don't need an inter- intercontinental ballistic missile to attach that to. So their old missiles from 20 years ago are perfectly fine. You don't need a reentry vehicle for an EMP attack. So they have. EMP missiles today. So that is a very severe threat that the media completely get wrong. They don't understand. Most of them don't even know what EMP is. So to kind of jump back. So my biggest concern is a long-term loss of the electrical grid. And that could be from an EMP attack in North Korea. That could be a, a massive solar flare, which we're long overdue for. 
That could be a cyber attack on our electric grid. If you haven't seen uh, the Showtime documentary called Zero Days, I highly recommend everybody watch that. It's about the threat of taking down our electric grid from a foreign power. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you have a physical attack on the electric grid, similar to the Metcalf substation attack here a few years back. And that's just a matter of time. So our electric grid is extremely vulnerable. It's extremely old. And the high voltage transformers that step up and step down power from our large power plants, there's about 3,000 of them in the country, they take over a year to build. And we only replace about a dozen a year. So you take out 3,000 of them, the chance of getting the electricity turned back on within years, it's just very unlikely. So the EMP Commission, who wrote a report to Congress in 2004 and 2008, the experts that have studied this estimate that 90% of the American population would be dead within the first year without electricity. Uh, Americans don't understand how electricity runs every single aspect of your life, from food distribution networks to fuel delivery, your water in your house, the internet, banking industries. It runs everything. And if you take that away, we're basically... You're turning back the clock 100 years. The problem is we don't have an infrastructure to maintain and feed people from 100 years ago. We don't have horse-drawn plows, and there's just no way to feed 350 million Americans without electricity. It's, it's physically impossible. So that's the biggest threat, in my opinion. But you also have to balance what's the biggest and the worst-case scenario with what's also the most likely to happen. Absolutely. So financial yeah. collapse is is absolutely a huge threat on the horizon. You know, if Brazil and Russia are able to get us off the U S dollar for oil, you know, the, if something like that were to happen, you could see a huge financial cost in this country. The other big high risk is a pandemic. Mm -hmm. We haven't developed antibiotics for the last 20 years. There are super bugs. So there's a lot of different things that you should be preparing for. And my big calling card and what I do with most of my clients, I tell them to prepare prepared for the worst. Make your plans for the worst case scenario. Because what I see a lot of times is people that are new into the preparedness aspect of it, they get into it because of a hurricane or something like that. And prepping for a hurricane or a tornado isn't really prepping. A lot of it's just common sense. Have some water in your basement, a flashlight, you know, a box of MREs. There's not a lot that goes into it. So from the prepping side of it, if you want to call us that, I would probably consider more of a hardcore prepper. I think you should focus more on the worst case scenario things. And it's expensive to do, Aaron, and you're not going to do it overnight. And I think a lot of people, they just bury their head in the sand. They're like, that's an insane situation. I couldn't imagine trying to pay the amount of money to prepare for that. So they just focus on little things. The problem with that is if a big thing happens, you don't have your mind wrapped around it. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? How are you going to handle it? So my philosophy is, is, Prepare for the worst case scenario, which again, I think is a long term loss of electric grid, and then slowly build your preps. But at least if, you, if you're prepared for the worst, if something minor happens, you can adjust on the fly then. But if you're preparing for something minor and something big happens, kind of screwed. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I've, I've looked at it a little differently, but that's, that's definitely a really interesting take. You know, and speaking of, the the big expenses, you know, retreats, that's that's a huge expense or a bug out location or a bowl, as some call it. Yeah. To me, that this is a very deep rabbit hole and a very fun rabbit hole. But, you know, I think it's very easy to lose your head for most people. It's very easy for them to lose their head up their own butts about it. Let's start here. Are there mental exercises or thought experiments you put people through so they understand how dark they'll go? in one of these situations and how dark their neighbors may go. And by dark, I mean, you know, just doing things that we would normally find extremely distasteful. That is an excellent question. That's an excellent question, Aaron. A lot of it comes down to faith and whether you see human beings as mostly good entities or mostly bad entities. So in today's society, a lot from the political left, would say that people are mostly good. They have a good heart and things of that nature. But a lot of that comes from we lived in a time of peace for the most part in this, in this world for a couple hundred years. You're, you don't have 
Viking warriors is is not an everyday job occupation, right? <laughs> For most so of us, yeah, yeah. The thing is, <laughs> so the thing is, is most people don't understand. They look at situations like Hurricane Katrina or the recent hurricanes. They're like, oh, we're Americans. We're going to band together. We're all going to hold hands, sing kumbaya, and walk through this situation and work together. And I will agree, in localized disasters, that's what we do. Because with that type of scenario, you've got somebody sitting on a couch somewhere with Cheeto dust on their chest, watching this on the news, and saying, man, that looks bad. I'm going to go help. Right? They've got a full belly. The problem with losing the electric grid on a nationwide basis is there's nobody coming to help. You are on your own. So there's a great uh, a world-renowned psychologist. His name's Philip Zimbardo. I don't know, Aaron, if you're familiar with the 1970s Stanford prison experiment mm, there, that they yeah. did with. Okay. So he was the one that actually ran that. His life work is studying how good people can commit evil atrocities. He, he, from a psychology standpoint, he studied the Germans and how they went along with the Holocaust. He studied how a everyday Oklahoma farm boy goes over to Vietnam and committed terrible atrocities while he was over there. And what he found is that if you figure in human desperation and you take away oversight, in other words, law and order, humans are capable of doing some very horrendous things. So I know a lot of people think, you know, I would never kill somebody for some food. I would never do this, do that. They've never been in a situation where they haven't eaten in two or three weeks straight. Like I mentioned earlier, they're looking at their four-year-old daughter on the couch who's about 10 minutes away from dying. That man, I don't care if he carries a Bible every day to work. I don't care his background. That man will do anything, or woman, will do anything to get food for that child. And if you're a next-door neighbor, and I, I really push the bug out of a big city scenario, because I know a lot of preppers can't think they can afford a survival retreat, but they put all this food and infrastructure in town if you don't think your neighbors are going to figure out that you're the only one that's not starving to death and they're not going to come for your food, and you don't have enough food to feed everybody on your block, so it's just a matter of time. Humans are capable of doing terrible, terrible atrocities against each other. I mean, just look at history. We've had law and order in society all over the world for such a long period of time. People have gotten complacent, and they think, ah, oh, we've risen past the Viking days. We've risen past the medieval days, and it's not true. It's human nature. Desperate, hungry people are definitely, even Americans, are capable of committing terrible, terrible atrocities if there's no law and order and there's a severe lack of food. How do you instill that in your clients when you're working through with people? Do you, is it just a matter of explaining it to them and showing them case studies? or? Yes and no. One of the big things I recommend, again, Philip Zimbardo, he wrote a book called The Lucifer Effect. Now, I don't agree with every single aspect of his theology. But for the most part, because I've experienced, I've seen what hungry and desperate soldiers in the field when I was a SEER instructor, just the insanely stupid things that they do when they're hungry and desperate, things completely out of their character hmm. that they would never think about going, making silly mistakes. Americans, they don't understand starvation and desperation. They don't understand it. You know, they, they point to the Congo and, and places like that where these atrocities happen. Well, guess what? Those people grew up hungry. They understand starvation. Their brains have been wrapped around that since birth. You take America here today and you take away our food infrastructure and people really start going hungry today and the entitlement mindset in this country, you take away their food, you're going to see rioting and looting on a scale that you can't even fathom. It's going to be way worse than over there because their brains aren't wrapped around being hungry. They don't understand the emotional feelings and the, the physical things that are happening to your body. We'll be back after this quick break. Listener, do you get at least $3 a month worth of value out of ITRH? You should see what we do for the Roving Horde Armada members. Check it out today by visiting ITRH.net. Members get access to episodes a day early access to monthly virtual and in-person meetups in some areas, an invitation to the secret ITRH Armada Facebook group so you can chat about survival all day long with like-minded people, 
access to every episode ever produced by IHRH. That's right, all the way back to the beginning, including one that was never aired. And those are just a few things you get with your membership when you sign up and become part of the ITRH roving horde by going to ITRH.net. Again, that's ITRH.net. You know, you mentioned a good thing was as far as people being able to afford a retreat. And I think this is an important thing to me because, like you said, people living in the city, I live in the fourth largest city uh, in the country. And so the idea of a return, <laughs> no, I mean, I actually, I, I like it. I love the woods. I love going out to the woods, but also I, I have several just personal reasons and stuff. I like being in the city, but mm-hmm. I also acknowledge, like, I would like to have a place to, and I think it's important in, in a lot of instances in scenarios to have a place to go, but there is that expense. How do you balance that? Exactly. So that is a very common question. It's- it's one of the big questions I, I covered in my preparedness manual. So I, I, I discuss this a lot because I do have some clients that don't have a lot of money. So most of my clients that I've worked with are they're pretty wealthy individuals. Some of them have more money than God. And so it's great because I live vicariously through them. I tell them to buy something, they buy five of them. It's mm-hmm. fantastic. But for those people that are working on a budget and trying to prepare on a budget, you don't have to own a survival retreat to get out of a major city. Hmm. The first point I want to make is if you're talking about a long-term collapse scenario, you have to get out of mass population centers. Because it goes back to the psychology thing. Right. You don't realize how bad it's going to get and how dangerous it's going to be for you to live in a city with millions of starving and desperate people around you. So, uh, you know, I really push that. The problem is, is a lot of people are just throw their hands up in the air and they're like, I don't have $500,000 to build an off grid survival retreat up on the side of a mountain somewhere. So I recommend the first order of a business would be to try and join an existing survival retreat. Now, this is a very touchy and difficult situation. Oh, yeah. I have an entire chapter on how to approach this privately and how not to give away your current preps to people that you're meeting. And unless you're an emergency room doctor or you've got some specialized skill that that existing survival retreat needs, you're probably not going to be successful in this. Right. Mm. So, but that's, that's the first thing. If you're, if you're a doctor, if you're a dentist, if you have some kind of specialized skill that would be really good for a post-class scenario, you might be able to find an existing group. If you can't do that, your next step would be to say, Hey, do I have an uncle Charlie? that owns a farm a hundred miles from the city. Do you know a second cousin that has a rural location that may not be great, but it's better than trying to to survive in the city? Yes. Well, what happens if Uncle Charlie thinks that you're a tinfoil nutcase for putting some food away and trying to prepare for hard times? Don't tell them. I tell people to rent a storage unit, the closest storage unit to that farm, and when the balloon goes up, you just show up at the farm and be like, oh, yeah, Uncle Charlie, by the way, I was right. You were wrong. And I've got a bunch of food down the road. You know, hook up the tractor with a hay wagon. Let's go get it. So that's my second recommendation. Let's say you don't have an Uncle Charlie in that situation. My next recommendation would be to start going on the weekends and looking for rental cabins that fit in survival retreat guidelines. In other words, they're you know, at least 150 miles from any major cities, five to 10 miles from any small towns and start renting rental cabins on the weekends until you find one that fits in those parameters of a survival retreat. There's an area there to grow a garden. It's off the beaten path. It's not visible from the road. Once you find that, do the same thing. Take your supplies, your long-term food, you know, all the stuff that you need to survive and store it in a storage unit close to that cabin and then just go and show up at that rental cabin when the time comes. Now, that said, you are not stealing that cabin from the owner. So if the owners of that cabin show up, you need to explain to them the situation. Hey, here's the situation. We've got food. We've got guns. We've got survival seed. Why don't we work together and make this work, right? Mm. So at the end of the day, a single family unit is going to have tough sledding to survive in this type of scenario. So adding a couple of people to your group, while it may take a hit on your long-term food, is probably better than trying to stay up 24 hours a day to keep an eye over your family. Okay. 
You know, I'm glad you brought up the the distance stuff. That that was really good, and I think that's been one of my questions as far as what is far enough out. Just out of curiosity, how did you come to those those specific numbers? There are no specific numbers, so <laughs> those were general numbers. There, yeah, um, yeah. It was a bit of a leading uh, question. Uh, finding the proper sur- bug out location, survival retreat property is. Likely the number one mistake that I see with my clients. The, the, by the time they contact me, they've already got a location and they bought a bad location is the problem. So there's two sides of this. So I love James Wesley Rawls, so I'm not coming down on him here, but his philosophy is you have to be out in Idaho somewhere 500 miles from the nearest town. Yes, and everything else is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, living off the grid beforehand. It, you know, if you have a career field where you can do that, more power to you, right? Mm-hmm. Good luck trying to get your wife to drive, you know, two hours to the nearest Walmart uh-huh. or, you know, to get the nearest Home Depot. But I mean, if you could do that, by all means, that's the best case scenario. But most of my clients live in the city. You need to live near a town to produce income in most cases. So the problem is, is nobody wants to drive five hours commute each direction from their bug out location to their work. So that's where the survival retreat mindset comes in. Now, any major city, I recommend my clients at least, I mean, bare minimum, bare minimum about a hundred to 150 miles away. The reasoning behind that is what I see is some of my clients who've already got properties, they live in this big city and they bought this property five, six hour drive away, this this great survival retreat property. They've got a $200,000 Atlas bunker there so on and so forth, they never get there because they bought a property too far away from their home. They get there twice a year. You know, maybe the first year they go there more often, but they never really get up there and work on their preps and work on their infrastructure at their survival retreat. So my recommendation is to have a retreat property within two to three hours driving distance. That way on a Friday afternoon, you're at work like, you know what, I'm going up to the cabin this weekend with the family. We'll unplug the phones and we'll spend the weekend up there. And it's not a big hassle to get there and get back. So with that said, when you get closer to a big city like that, you kind of need a trained eye to find the right location. Because like I said, you don't want to be close to small towns. You want to be at the end of a dead end road. Ideally, you want to be not visible from the road. You know, if you have a chimney that's producing smoke, you have to think about the location of, are you on the side of a hill where People can see or sound can travel from your retreat down. There's there's a hundred checkpoints that I look at when doing a survival retreat location. You'll never find the perfect property. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But buying the wrong property from the get-go and then putting a bunch of money into it is really tough. Because I mean, I've done some survival retreat analysis where I've showed up and I'm just like, you know, I've got to tell this guy this is put all this money into the wrong location. Uh, but I mean, that's what they're paying me to do. They, they want, right. you know, honesty. And I think that a lot of so-called prepper experts, they want to give people a false sense of security. So they realize that this is a very overwhelming thought process to even think about leaving your home, fleeing a city, going into the unknown if you don't have the money. And it's a tough thing to wrap your head around. So they'll tell, they'll teach people, oh, how to board up your windows in town, how to do this and that, and how to put a high fence in your backyard to hide your garden, so on and so forth. That's not going to do it. There's not a houses aren't designed to be bulletproof. It's just a matter of time. So a big enough group comes along and and takes you out and your neighbors are going to notice you gardening in your backyard, whether you have a high fence or not. So, you know, it's funny you brought up husband and husbands and wives. And I think that is a common question that I get asked and do you have situations where a husband comes to you, or for that matter, there are I've plenty of situations where a wife is trying to convince a husband. Yes. Do you have people come to you and say, hey, I need a place, but first I need you to help me get my wife or husband on board? <laughs> yeah, that is a very common thing that I get emailed and asked by fans and by clients. So that said, I think the first thing I want to mention is this is not a guy thing. You'd be surprised. I would say probably 30% of my clients or the why yeah. in the situation. Yeah. Husbands are busy working and 
they basically taking over preparing the family for a hard time, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's the best case scenario because the wife is typically the, the home is her castle, right? You know, she's the one that goes to the grocery store in a lot of cases and gets the food stuff. This is something that she should definitely be involved in. So on that front, I actually co-authored a book called Alone by C.M. Hollerman. And that's my sister. <laughs> She's a much better writer than I am. <laughs> and so what we wanted to do was take my first book and we took one of the, the side characters, one of the background characters, and wrote the background story from a woman's point of view. Hmm. So most of the prepper fiction genre is very young ho Rambo, alpha dog. Women can't do anything if they don't have a man there to protect them. Blah, yeah. blah, 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 One blah. man against the world. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, it's it's and it's silly. Yeah. And so we wanted to present the other side of the story from a woman's perspective and, and how that would work out. So the other thing is, is the reason I find when a guy approaches me and says, oh, my wife's not on board, I'm like, okay, so you're reading articles, you're doing research, you're doing X, Y, Z to educate yourself on these various threats, but you're doing that. So it comes down to information. If you give the person the right amount of information where they can perceive the threat and see the threat, it then comes down to common sense. Well, that's scary. You know, we should do something about that. And then you get the wife on board. The question is, how do you do that? So a couple of my big recommendations are there is a I think it was Discovery, might have been History Channel. Uh, American Blackout is a movie on a cyber attack mm -hmm. taking down the electric grid. It's kind of like a mini movie that you can watch with your with your spouse. And that's a good eye-opening thing. The movie or the documentary Zero Days by Showtime. I know Showtime of all things put this out. <laughs> but I, if you want to get hit up the side of the head with a two by four on the threat that cyber attack plays to our country today and taking down the electric grid, that is an extraordinarily eye-opening view of what life looks like after taking down the electric grid. Now, that said, I don't agree with the ending of the movie because America, I'm going back to American Black, and I don't agree with the end of that because the problem is, is 10 days later, you know, the world's falling apart. People are killing people over a can of peaches. The, it follows different families and how they, how they handle the situation. One's like your your atypical prepper crazy guy wearing fatigues. He takes his family up to the survival retreat and the world falls apart. And then all of a sudden, 10 days later, they turn the electricity on. They don't explain how they did that, mm -hmm. but they turn the electricity on and everybody's like, Oh, okay. And then like kind of the, the idea is that everybody just goes back to driving their Prius to Starbucks the next day. And if you, <laughs> society falls apart to that level where atrocities are starting to be committed, you don't just come back from that right away. So anyways, but it's a it's a great movie to introduce somebody to what the world looks like uh, in a societal class scenario. Yeah, so those are a couple of my my big. So it's more about just getting them involved and not being the only person doing the research and the only person exactly. rounding themselves around an axle about what can happen. Exactly. I mean, uh, so they approach me like, "Well, my wife's not really on board with this," or "My husband, you know, doesn't really care. He's just kind of left it up to me." and I'm like, so what information are you sharing with them? Are you sharing news stories on this subject? Are you sharing, have you ever printed out the EMP commission report and, you know, ask them to read it? Or have you ever, if you're the only one soaking in all the information on this, you can't expect them to have the same point of view on the scenario that you do if, if you're the only one getting the information. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's great stuff. You know, and, and this also takes us to getting to the point where and this is another big thing that I know people wrestle with when to bug out. So what sort of matrix or model or indicators or systems of determining when to bug out do you use and, and share and teach? Sure. So the first thing you have to look at is why are you bugging out? Like what's the actual scenario pushing you to bug out? So in the case of a financial collapse, it's typically something that happens over the course of days, weeks, months. You see the writing on the wall. You have time at the last minute to go out and buy food and buy supplies. My recommendation is to bug out sooner than later. You don't want to get trapped, right? You don't want to get penned in by traffic jam. In the case of a financial class, that's tough because you have to sit there and say, well, my boss wants me to show up for work tomorrow. 
there's rioting and looting going on everywhere. Like, am I willing to risk my job and pack up my family and head off to Uncle Charlie's farm? That is an individual thing that everyone's going to have to decide for themselves. So that's the least of my concerns. And so in the case of a pandemic, which would be next, that's also something that happens over weeks and months, and you're going to see it getting worse and worse and worse. And society's going to shut down a lot faster with the pandemic than a lot of people think, because if it's a very deadly pandemic, I'm talking about something that kills people quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Something that spreads fast, kills people quickly. And that type of scenario, the longer you stay in town, the more risk you have of catching it, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to avoid interaction with other people. And so at some point you're have to make a decision. This is getting too crazy. We need to get out of mass. We got to get, you got to get away from people. You have to stop having human interaction. So Again, that is a because it's something that happens over time. I can't say, oh, uh, 24 hours or 48 hours. It's something that you just have to use your brain on. The one thing you need to be aware of that a lot of people don't talk about is in the case of a very serious pandemic, if you're in one of the primary cities where this thing broke out, like let's say you're in Chicago, and that's one of the epicenters of where the pandemic started, you run a very big risk of the military shutting down borders with the neighboring states and the National Guard stepping in and basically not letting you leave. Mm -hmm. So there are plans in place to do that, to quarantine areas of the country that where the infection breaks out. So my, again, I go back to my recommendation is to get out sooner than later because you don't want to get trapped in a city with a bunch of sick and desperate and starving people. So that's a pandemic on the long-term loss of the electric grid. If you're looking at cyber attacks, EMP attacks, Basically, where the power comes down, the situation it depends. If it's EMP attack, it's going to wipe out maybe fifty percent of the cars on the road. If it's a solar flare, it's not going to affect the cars. What you don't want to do is wait. I think a lot of people their plan is, well, I, you know, I'm going to stay in my house. This is my comfort zone, right? And this is what I know. This is where I've got food in the cupboards here. My kids feel comfortable here. We're going to stay here until it gets so bad that we need to leave. The problem is if you wait a week or two weeks to bug out of the city, it's extremely dangerous time frame to be driving your, your bug out truck laden down with food and supplies down the road. Assuming you can even get through the traffic jams of your big city. Mm-hmm. Or if you're bugging out on foot with backpacks. If you're on the open road two or three weeks in, you're a target. There's going to be people that are going to wonder what you have in that backpack and and they're going to be hungry and they're going to want that food and supplies. So in the case of an EMP type situation, my recommendation is always to leave at first light the following morning of when the event happens. So if the electric grid comes down, you understand what's happening. Most 90% of Americans won't understand. They'll be expecting the government to step in, turn turn the switch back on. They're not going to realize that it's not coming back on. And so it'll take them a few days to really figure things out. So if you can walk out of town, you know, my primary objective is for my clients to be at their retreat or at their location that they're heading to within four days. So the first night you get all your stuff together, you go through your bug out bags, make sure everything's ready to go. Maybe uh, if you have an operable vehicle, maybe you take cash that first day and go to all the mom and pop little grocery stores. And buy as much food, canned food as you can. Even if you have food, extra food doesn't hurt. Basically, spend that first evening and night kind of getting geared up to leave at first light the following day. So that's my recommendations on when to bug out as far as a a class. The overarching point is don't wait till it gets so bad that you're like, man, this was a bad idea to stay here. We got to leave. At that point, if you're on the open road a couple weeks in, chances of you making it where you want to go or swim to none. Yeah. And I think that brings up another thing as far as people have a lot of concern, both in the here and now when everything is presumably stable and when things go dark or start to go dark security at a remote location. What, I guess, what are some Mm -hmm. general tips on that? Cause I know that really worries me. I'm like, God, how do I monitor and, and know if anything's happening or going wrong with the location? If I'm only going out there every few weeks and stuff. I'm also a little paranoid, so. <laughs> that's, that's a loaded question. There's, <laughs> again, there's a hundred different aspects of operational security I look at. 
when I'm doing survival retreat analysis, uh, the first thing comes down to the location. Is it in a good location? A good location, the key to a good location is minimizing your interaction with people stumbling across you, right? So if you're 500 miles away from a major city in Montana, chances of people stumbling across you are going to be pretty slim, right? If you're on the East Coast here and you're tucked in behind some farmer's field somewhere close to some, some other towns, your key is sound discipline. In other words, not doing anything that produces a lot of sound. A lot of people have diesel generators for power. In a quiet world, a diesel generator, the sound of a diesel generator is going to go really far. Light discipline. So at night, going to bed when it gets dark, getting up when it gets light, not having candles and lights on in your house at night or, you know, blocking out your windows to make sure no, no light escapes. When I was a seer instructor, one of my first trips out in the woods, and I was looking over at a mount, the next mountain over, and it was probably close to a mile away. And I kept seeing like an, a, a really light orange glow on the other the hillside, just a small, in, in the trees. I could see the trees. And I asked the instructor, I said, what is that? He goes, oh, somebody's smoking over there. So from a mile away in the mountains, I could see somebody, every time they inhaled that cigarette, the trees around them glowed orange. Mm -hmm. So light discipline is extremely important. And that goes away, you know, that goes towards not having your cabin or your location, see, being able to see it from the road. A lot of people are into wood stoves. A wood stove is a cheap thing to put in a, a cabin to, to heat it in the winter. The problem is, is you're producing an Indian smoke signal you know, hundreds of yards up in the air. If you're the only chimney that's producing smoke in the winter, you're just advertising a long distance away that you have heat and maybe you have food. People might come check you out. There's a there's a thing called a masonry wood heater. It is looks like a fireplace, but it absorbs. I don't, I don't want to get real depth, but it absorbs ninety percent of the heat into a stone structure, and it slowly radiates it throughout your house throughout the day. You can heat a 2,500-square-foot house with a single masonry heater, and you use a third less wood, and it doesn't produce any smoke. They're, they're a little costly to, to have built because it's built from fire brick, but if you're building an actual survival retreat, that's a huge recommendation if you're in a cold climate. Cool. So, you know, having an area around your cabin, you know, a lot of people have these in the woods, like you're tucked in, in a bunch of trees. Well, you're not going to see a group of people so they're right on top of you. I, with all my client retreats from an operational security standpoint, I always, always, always have the philosophy of live to fight another day. Avoid gunfight like the play. It makes for great fiction and great stories and great TV shows. But the last thing you want to do is take a bullet in a collapse scenario where there's no hospitals, right? There's no military helicopter coming in to fly you off the battlefield to a Ford looking at our Ford operating base with the latest and greatest medical people there to treat gunshot wounds. If you get a gunshot wound in a cop scenario, there's a good chance it's going to get infected and there's a good chance you're probably going to die from it. So the last thing you want to do is, is enter into gunfights. So all my survivor retreats that I design, I always have a tunnel network to get out from underneath that house. You get surrounded by a, large group of looters, open the front door and go up the tunnel, live to fight another day. The key to that is not having all your food in your basement. So having a cache on your property where you keep 90% of your food, right? That way you, you open the front door, you go out the tunnel. That way, if they come in and they clean out your kitchen cabinets and your pantry, they'll maybe spill some blankets or whatever else you have laying around in your retreat. And then they leave and they go on down the road. You move back into your retreat and you still have 90% of your food. Now, if you put all that food in the basement, now I understand, you know, not wanting to give it up. Because if you bug out the back door and they come in and take all your food, now you're in a, a big pickle, right? Mm. So I don't believe in building fortresses. So all my properties have a lot of security aspects to them. But at the same time, they're designed to winning a gunfight with a small group. If it's a big fighting group that's coming, get out of there. Let them let them steal some food in there. There's no 
this this whole Rambo prepper mentality that you're going to get in these gunfights and you're you know your wife's not going to get shot in the head next to you. Mm-hmm. That changes the whole dynamic, right? Right. People get shot, people get killed in gunfights. I don't care how squared away you are, and you cannot build a fortress. So that's the other thing I see people do is they're trying to build these fortresses up in the mountains, these concrete fortresses. You know, unless you've got millions and millions of dollars, and even then, a good squad of guys, no place is impenetrable. I don't care how, how secure you think your survival retreat is. It's just a matter of time until somebody's going to get in. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I prefer secrecy to fortresses when it comes to survival retreat design. Brilliant. You know, and speaking of survival retreat design, so you are a consultant, you do this, this is your full-time gig. So what do you do? You, and when is the best time for somebody to contact you? If Whether they feel they're really ready for this or not, if they feel it's something they want and they want to start that journey towards not just getting a remote location, but doing it right. If you're on a budget, I have a book called Survival Theory prepared this guy how to bug out and survive the end of the world on a budget on a budget you know if you're making a thousand dollars a month and you have no disposable income i I, i'll be blunt with people you're gonna have a tough time you're gonna have a tough go of it i do put some things through there that you can you know maybe try and achieve but if you don't have any disposable income it's going to be tough to do but for your average everyday person construction worker blue collar guy there are things, steps that you can take to start preparing for this type of scenario. And a lot of it has to do with game planning, having a written plan of action in place. So that book, I would say, would be the first step for somebody that wants to wrap their head around. That's why I call it survival theory. Build a game plan and then move forward. So one big issue I see is people starting out prepping. They'll go to some website. The website would be like, this is how you prep. Go out and buy this, 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 and this. Well, you're going out and you're buying a bunch of stuff, and you don't even have your mind wrapped around the different scenarios. You don't have a written plan of action down on a piece of paper. Well, if it's a pandemic, I'm going to do this. If it's a financial class, I'm going to do this. If it's an EMP attack, I'm going to do this. Build your plans of actions first. Prepare for the worst, hope for the best, and then figure out how, you know, a couple hundred bucks each month, start out with, you know, some food, some some water purification methods, start out with the the life essential stuff. Because another thing I see is I've got clients I go out and, this, you know, I mentioned the number one issue I see, which is actually the probably number two, which is the wrong property. The number one issue I, I see is not enough long-term food. So people buy a year's supply of food from one of these long-term food companies. And it's one of the biggest, most dishonest things in this industry that I can't stand. So people are buying based on serving sizes and they don't understand the amount of food they're buying. So most of my receipt analysis, I'll go there and they're like, oh yeah, I've got a year's worth of X company's long-term food. And I said, well, <laughs> you've got four months. Yeah. So let's punch in your base. Let's go to a basal metabolic calculator online, punch in your height, weight, sex for each member of your family, your age, and then find, you know, find out exactly how many calories you need on a yearly basis. If you look at most of those one-year food plans, they don't advertise the amount of calories on those. Usually, you have to email the company to find out. A uh, client just emailed me one here the other day, and it was two people, one year food supply, and it was their their premium one year food supply. It wasn't even one of their lower class ones. We crunched the numbers, and it worked out to be for two adults, it worked out to be 450 calories a day. <laughs> that's insane. That's, mm-hmm. that, that's criminal. You're, you're giving people a false sense of hope that they have a year's worth of food and they've got like two months, three, maybe, when the average man, five foot eight, 180 pounds, is going to need like 2,800 calories a day. And the average female is going to need 16 or 1,700 calories a day. So that's a big issue I see uh, when, when doing this. So as far as when you come out and you do like your, your bigger package of, of consulting and somebody brings you out or sits down with you and does calls, what, like what kind of services do you offer there? How do you work with people that way going beyond the book? Before I do any on-site analysis, I always do, um, I charge $150 for the first one hour consultation. And so I have them email me basically where they're at right now with their current plans, with their 
what their ultimate goal is, how they plan to get there, what their budget looks like. So I have some background information on them. And then we spend an hour talking about their location, their game plan, whether they're going to survival retreat or what their plan of action is. And I can cover a lot of ground in that first one hour consultation. It also lets me, you know, gets me a good feel of who I'm talking to, right? I have never not worked with a client. I've got clients that are on the far left of the political spectrum that think Donald Trump is going to blow the world up. I've got (laughs) clients on the far right side. I don't work with militia groups. I don't work with any kind of crazy people. Luckily, you know, I have that on my website. So luckily I haven't (laughs) had any issues with that. (laughs) But uh, it's one of those things that I do a one hour phone consultation. We can cover a lot of ground in that first hour. And then after that, usually that we email back and forth and they'll fly me out to do an onsite analysis. I, um, and I have a, a big portfolio that I go there and I, it takes me 10 hours, a full 10 hour day to go through a survival retreat, to go through this portfolio, look at up their location, look at everything, walk the property, uh, look at their supplies. And we just, you know, we go through this big portfolio of questions. It's, it's essentially like, I think it's like 500 questions or points that I make. And we address each one individually and the person takes notes and areas where they can improve, areas where they're doing good. So uh, that, and that's probably 60% of my business. And then 40% of it is I work with people that are building survival retreats from the ground up. I help them locate the right property. I've got about 20 to 25 different cabin designs that uh, work very well in off-grid situation, even without electricity where heat and air can flow through the, the cabin. Uh, and I'm talking from small little 500 square foot cabins all the way up to four or 5,000 square foot lodges that are designed for 20, 30, 40 people. So my biggest group that I've worked with was about 75 people. Oh, it, was wow. a, it was a church group. And that's always tough. You know, we could get into the weeds with, with, with oh, that yeah. group. And, you know, I never share with, I never share any of my clients names or locations or anything like that. So I'm just talking kind of generally mm-hmm. over the top here. So somebody decides, you know, this Jonathan guy sounds cool. He sounds squared away. He's, he's on top of things. He's my brand of wacky. This is a, this is a rabbit hole. I want to go down. How do they connect with you? You have a website. Tell us about that. Yeah, so my website is griddownconsulting.com, Grid Down Consulting. I have a contact me page in there. I also have a bio page where you can get a little more in depth on my background, my thought process, and, and how I got into this. And then I have a, my books are on my website as well. I have a, a EMP, Equipping Modern Patriots, fictional series. I've sold over 100,000 copies of my first book now. It was a top 10 bestseller for about four months when I first released it here a few years back. And uh, so that's been very successful. I actually just released the third book of the trilogy here three weeks ago. Oh, that's awesome. So if you're looking for, I I call it informational fiction. So Mm -hmm. it's giving ideas and and thoughts and strategies for people in a fictional setting. I also have this survival theory, uh, the full-length preparedness guide. And I am currently writing the follow-up to that. I hope to have that out in January. And then I co-authored a book called Alone with Sam Hollerman. And that is written from a, a female perspective, a woman's point of view. Uh, so those are, those are my books. I have a DVD, uh, two-disc DVD set called Survival Bug Out. I shot in coordination with the Survival Summit. And I, and I don't just do on-site analysis. So a lot of my clients, I, I haven't even been to their retreat yet. We just do it all over the phone. Now, oh, okay. I can get pretty far on the phone, phone consultation, but I, you know, it's hard to make specific recommendations if you don't have boots on the ground and actually physically see the location. Right, right, so right. I use Google Earth a lot and things like that, but um, it, it's better at some point, at some point, if I can actually get there and, and take a look at it. Cool. So tell us your website address one more time where they can go connect with you and, and check out all your other goodies. Sure. GridDownConsulting.com. Awesome. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing bugging out with us. No problem, Aaron. It's been a pleasure. Show notes, links to learn more about Jonathan and other resources from this episode can be found by going to in the rabbit hole.com slash E two thirty seven. 
Support the show and get ITRH Roving Horde Armada members-only benefits. Like what you say? Like twice-monthly virtual hangs, access to the secret ITRH Armada Facebook group, and the on-demand bug-out bag class. That's just to name a few things. Go to ITRH.net. Now, twice a month, members get access to a private, secure video chat where we talk about guns, mead, food storage, or whatever is on your mind, blows your hair back, or skirt up. Go to ITRH.net to read more. Again, that's ITRH.net to find out about the exclusive members-only benefits. With that, we wrap up episode number 237 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound. Stay safe and sound.